This video falls under the fair use law. The following is a fan summary, for entertainment purpose, only which is not intended to replace the original series, we do not own the anime, manhwa, or any of the artworks all rights reserved to their respective owners, please support the official release of this series, this is for people's enjoyment only. This video is not meant to infringe any of the copyrights. After L had initially settled his affairs with the villagers, he immediately moved on to his next step, happily heading to a place he hadn't visited in a while. Standing on a cliff, he looked down at the city where he had started his journey. The sun rose on the horizon, casting a golden glow over the city. El stood exactly where he had once looked down on the city with his mother, it was the kingdom of Banzar Kashia, where the Dibel store was located. It appeared unchanged, just as it was when El had left the kingdom. Dibel sat at a table, signing important documents brought to him by his secretary. One by one, he signed, processed them, and then handed them back to his secretary to handle the rest. Since gaining the right to sell magical stones and L, the fame of his small store had rapidly risen. He thought of L, considering him a crucial customer and business partner. Dibel also reminisced about watching L grow up and witnessing his entire development. Lost in his thoughts about L, he hoped that L was doing well and wished him all the best for the future. He also recalled recently reading in the newspaper that the residence of the esteemed Marquis Einhardt had exploded. This immediately made him wonder if L had something to do with it. His surprise was evident as he read the article. Before L left the kingdom, he had inquired with Dibel about Marquis Einhardt. Dibel hoped that the information he had provided L hadn't led him to destroy the residence. He couldn't find any information about the explosion, no matter whom he asked. Folding his hands together, he hoped that L was safe and living somewhere secure. Lost in thoughts of L, Dibel's secretary had to call his name several times, growing louder each time, until he snapped back to reality. Completely bewildered, he asked his secretary how long she had been standing there. She replied that she had been calling his name for quite a while. She then informed him that one of the important customers he had just talked about was suddenly standing outside his door. Dibel was utterly surprised and repeated if he had understood correctly what his secretary had just said. She confirmed it and escorted the high-ranking customer into Dibel's premises. L mentioned that it had been a while since they last saw each other, wearing an ecstatic expression and a smile on his face, completely astonished, L's name was conveyed. L wasted no time and straightforwardly stated his purpose, which was to discuss a few matters with Dibel. However, Dibel didn't address what L had said. Instead, he rushed towards him, shaking him all over and asking if he was safe and if he had any injuries. He naturally inquired about L's siblings and his mother, making sure they were all okay. He explained that he had heard something significant had happened at the Marquis' estate and couldn't curb his curiosity. Dibel told L that he had been quite disturbed since he heard about it. Almost unable to think about anything else, considering it might have something to do with L and he could be the reason for the explosion. L, still in Dibel's grip, was somewhat surprised but eventually reassured him. L thanked him for his concern and explained that everyone was fine. He then said with a smile that it felt good when someone cared about him. Dibel released his hold on L, adjusted his glasses hanging on a chain around his neck, and apologized for letting his emotions run wild. He explained that he reacted that way because he had known L since he was seven years old and that L meant a lot to him. Dibel then gestured to a seat and asked L to please sit down. He cleared his throat, took a seat opposite L, and asked him what he came for and what there was to discuss. L wanted to be honest from the start and told him that he planned to build a magical tower. This astonished Dibel again, and he repeated L's words in disbelief. Additionally, through L's plans, he realized that the news he had read in the newspaper could connect the explosion to L. L confirmed this and mentioned that, although it might be hard to believe, he was now a seventh-level mage. This news hit Dibel like a lightning bolt, and he couldn't stop being amazed. With wide-open eyes, he told L that since he first saw him at a young age, he had felt that he was someone very important and extraordinary. However, he never thought that in his twenties, L would already grow into a seventh-level mage. 
Daibo then asked El where he planned to build a magical tower. El told him that he planned to build it in the Manticorn Gorge. Once again, Daibo repeated El's words incredulously. He asked if he understood correctly and if El really intended to build his tower in one of the three restricted areas of the continent, specifically in the monster-filled Manticorn region, however, El only responded with a smile, affirming that he meant exactly that and Daibo had understood everything correctly. Daibo had to admit to himself that he had assessed El correctly, as an unpredictable person whose next moves couldn't be predicted. In any other land, someone planning to build a magical tower would be welcomed with open arms. This would imply that El had the freedom to choose any good location to settle. Thus, it seemed illogical to Daibo that El would choose to build a magical tower in the land of monsters. Deep down, however, Daibo knew he shouldn't doubt El's decision, as he was sure El had a larger plan that was not yet apparent to him. So, he simply told El that he agreed and thought it was a good idea. This surprised El, who was a bit confused, stating that he hadn't explained everything yet and wondered why he was already getting approval from Daibel. Daibel, sitting across from El, said that everything El did was new and exciting. And he was eagerly anticipating where his new journey would take him. He wanted to know what plan El had next. El smiled at Daibel's trust and then proceeded to explain his next plans. As Daibel had suspected, El's plans were indeed exciting, and he was confident that, if successful, the business would become one of the best on the entire continent. Daibel also mentioned that he wanted to start recruiting the people necessary for the construction of the magical tower and asked El when would be the best time to have them ready. El told him that the sooner he could find the people, the better. However, with a mixed expression on his face, he also asked if it would be challenging to find such individuals. Daibel answered honestly, also with a mixed expression, that it might be somewhat difficult to find people willing to work on a magical tower, especially in an area where the Manticore King resides. Upon hearing this, the mixed feelings disappeared from El's face, and with confidence, he said that this problem would no longer exist. In the Manticore Gorge, there was a small river with crystal clear water, into which a waterfall flowed. Surrounding the area were many green trees, and a gentle breeze wafted through. Almost no one ventured to this little shaded spot in the gorge, as it was the territory of the Manticore King, who was taking a nap at the edge of the river. A few of his subjects also made themselves comfortable nearby. Resting, however, an astonishing and dreadful unknown energy roused the Manticore King from his nap. He yawned, revealing his sharp and pointed teeth, stretched out, and let out a terrifying roar as his first response, indicating to all creatures in his vicinity the foul mood he was in due to this disturbance. As the Manticore King rose, he reached an impressive height of six meters, surrounded by a dark aura. His eyes glowed at least as red as the jewel on his forehead and his combat level surpassed that of a swordmaster. After taking a few minutes to wake up and stretch, he began running as fast as possible toward the source of the unknown energy, a stormy expression on his face. Normally, Manticore kings had several subjects in their vicinity protecting and observing their territory. However, this Manticore king was different, he had great confidence in his own strength, believing that nothing and no one could kill him. That was why he was so eager to locate the mysterious energy that disturbed his senses and made him doubt his strength. With full speed, the large cat ran faster and faster, leaping over obstacles, ready to confront his adversary when he arrived at the site of the mysterious energy. Upon arrival, he saw three magical iron golems controlled by L. One stood at the front, the other two a step behind. To demonstrate his power, the Manticore King roared thunderously again. In response, El appeared on the shoulder of one of the golems, stating that the king had now fallen into his trap. It was no surprise to El, as he knew from the beginning that the king was nothing more than a monster. However, it was also not surprising that the king was a monster, to have so many other Manticores under one's command, one had to be a genuine monster to lead such a herd. El also sensed the dense dark aura emanating from the king. It was so intense that even El had to shield himself and acknowledge the potential danger of the situation. Yet, despite the inherent danger, 
El's adventurous spirit took over again, and he wanted to discover the origin of this dark aura. Standing up from his sitting position, El looked at his opponent, ready to begin uncovering the source of the dark aura. However, the large cat, not willing to engage in a non-combat position, hissed in response, prepared to defend itself and its territory. Without saying a word, one of the large iron golems on El's side charged toward the wild cat to teach it some manners. It swung its right hand, about to deliver a powerful blow to the cat. However, before the strike could land, the manticore defended itself with its scorpion-like tail, deflecting the attack. This even astonished El, who had to acknowledge the manticore's incredibly fast reflexes. Not only were the reflexes quick, but the iron tail managed to seriously damage the armor of the iron golem, rendering it incapacitated. Recognizing the situation, El immediately sent his other two golems to attack the manticore together. This time, one of the golems even managed to land a punch to the manticore's face. However, it seemed to have little effect on the cat, as the manticore effortlessly defended against the attack with its iron skin. El realized that the attacks were not strong enough to penetrate this iron skin. Aware of his absurd strength, the manticore, not giving El and his golems any time to rest, prepared for a counterattack. It bit into the armor of the iron golems and defeated a second one by freeing the golem from one of its arms. This golem fell to the ground, making it clear that El's opponent wouldn't be easy. The manticore was a true king who had often defended his territory and proven his position. Even though two of the three iron golems had already been defeated, the third golem continued to charge forward, attempting to attack the manticore from behind. However, the manticore noticed this sneak attack and once again managed to fend it off. Using its hind legs, it struck the last three iron golems in the face, defeating them as well, leaving them on the ground with broken armor. Viewed from above, the manticore, surrounded by the three iron golem corpses, stood firmly on the battlefield, reaffirming its position as the ruler of the area. To prove his strength to El, he roared again, creating a frenzied shockwave and shouting at him. El had to admit that this manticore king was much stronger than he had initially thought. He looked over at his golems and realized that their regeneration speed was too slow, leading him to conclude that the wild cat's attacks were quite powerful. Aware of his situation, El intervened and intended to summon Tana, his golden golem, into the fight. However, before it could be summoned, the manticore seized the opportunity and attacked with one of its front claws. El was shocked that he had miscalculated in this situation and was struck by the king's mighty blow, being thrown backward. Helplessly, El was thrown across the forest by the manticore's blow and landed on the ground. The manticore wasted no time and leaned over El, causing him to slowly dissolve. The manticore then looked upward, sensing El's presence there. El needed a moment to catch his breath and was relieved that he had initially led a phantom fight against the manticore king, allowing him to safely observe everything from above. Otherwise, the battle might have already come to an end. El initially wanted to finish the fight with his normal golems and would have been content to do so. However, since the manticore king was a king for a reason, he had to get serious. Since his phantom earlier hadn't had the opportunity to summon Tana. The original now performed this task. Behind El, a magical circle opened, and beneath him on the rock, a portal to another dimension appeared. Tana leaped out, ready to confront the Cat King. El spoke down to Tana, commanding her to engage in this battle without her sword and to initiate Plan B. Tana confirmed the command and prepared to face the beast. Swiftly, she charged forward, intending to land a blow on the wild cat like the first iron golem. However, unlike the iron golem, the manticore king dodged this time, avoiding the attacks. After a successful dodge, the manticore king leaped forward with its two front claws, attempting to attack Tana as well. However, Tana managed to evade the attack without taking a hit. She then took another approach, attempting to counterattack. Unfortunately, the manticore dodged her counter, causing her attack to miss once again. Unfortunately, Tana found herself in an unfavorable position afterward, with her back to the Manticore King. 
However, she managed to turn around at the last moment when the Manticore King was ready to attack again. Unlike the previous occasions when he relied on his physical superiority, the Manticore King initiated a different attack this time. He opened his mouth and unleashed a powerful burst of dark aura in the form of a beam towards Tana, who tried to shield herself from the attack behind her hands. El was surprised that even Tana was having trouble fighting against this Manticore King. However, he also knew that his golden golem had not yet begun to fight seriously. El signaled to Tana that it was time to stop playing and to fight seriously now. Her eyes lit up, and she began to get serious. After the Manticore King's attack subsided, Tana raised her right arm and began storing a massive amount of fiery aura in her fist, of course, the Manticore King was not willing to let this happen and quickly charged towards his opponent. However, Tana had already gathered enough aura in her fist and, much like Gone from Hunter x Hunter, unleashed a powerful strike that directly hit the large wild cat. The Manticore King was thrown backward through the air and landed on the ground. Thanks to Tana's forceful blow. In contrast, Tana stood unharmed before him, ready to finish the job. Seizing the opportunity, Tana jumped onto the body of the Manticore King, knelt down, and intended to end the cat's life. However, when El spoke, saying that it was enough and that he wanted her to stop, both Tana and the Manticore King looked at him in surprise. El stated that there was no reason to take the Manticore King's life. Even the large wild cat, surprised by this, sat before El and appeared like a well-behaved kitten. God, I wish my cats were that sweet. This surprised El as well, who didn't know what was happening. After this battle, it engulfed our protagonist back into the small village of Ken. Which he had previously saved from the two manticores. Captain Miter couldn't believe what was unfolding before his eyes and was left in awe. While the manticore king, still in a normal state and towering at six meters, snuggled up to his new owner, seeking attention, L, equally surprised as Captain Miter, emotionlessly informed him that he had taken care of the manticore king's problem. Even after a few minutes, Captain Miter couldn't believe what he saw and thought about the potential destruction if such a massive monster were to rampage here. However, El assured him that he had the situation under control and suggested Captain Miter see his new pet as nothing more than a gigantic cat. He invited Captain Miter to gently pet it. With a broad grin on its face, the Manticore King eagerly looked forward to a nice petting session. Captain Miter, however, still harbored serious doubts about casually petting such a large kitty. But before he could contemplate it further, the Manticore King licked Captain Miter across the face, trying to show that there was no need to fear him anymore. After that, the Manticore King had a very peaceful expression, and Captain Miter asked El what he planned to do with this monster now. El explained to Miter once again that the Manticore King was at least as strong as a semi-grandmaster rank knight and had the ability to command other lower-level Manticores. He planned to use his new pet to make his life easier and command the other Manticores, while the drool and saliva of the cat dripped down onto Captain Miter, he understood what El had in mind and had to admit that it was a good idea. El then informed the captain that he would now begin the construction of a magical tower to make the land safer for him and the villagers, allowing them to live in peace and tranquility. With the realization that he could finally start implementing his plans, El was as happy as his new pet, sporting a wide grin on his face. Three months had passed since the Manticore King disappeared from the Manticore Gorge. The construction of the magical tower was underway and the entire process had gone relatively smoothly so far. Inside the magical tower, a teleportation portal had been created, directly linking Dybul's shop to the magical tower. Thanks to the people Dybul had hired, the expensive materials for the tower could be transported quickly. While the diligent workers were busy building the tower, El's mother and sisters assisted with provisions. It didn't take long for the outer facade of the magical tower to slowly take shape. It was a large golden tower, unmatched in its grandeur, extending several floors into the sky. Occasionally, people approached the vicinity of the large golden magical tower, looked up in disbelief, and wondered what on earth this enormous building was. 
most were uncertain about the nature of the structure, often labeling it simply as a large warehouse. However, a crucial part of L's plans had now commenced, running parallel to the construction of his magical tower. The first step was to capture and relocate the smaller manticores. Many vanished on their own after the disappearance of their king, dispersing into nearby forests L used his magic to capture the remaining smaller cats and transported them to another dimension. As this was no easy task and fundamentally changed life in the land, many people were fascinated by the success of L's plan, bringing him great happiness. Gradually, fewer manticores circled around L's magical tower. And the attacks from these dangerous wild cats nearly dropped to zero. It became possible to build more houses in the immediate vicinity of the magical tower. Before long, a large city with 15,000 inhabitants peacefully emerged around the magical tower, L's mother and his siblings also noticed this fact and witnessed the peaceful life that was previously not possible. Together, they sat at a table and discussed how, if they hadn't experienced it themselves, they would never have believed that this territory had previously been inhabited by wild wildcats that had terrified the people here. While Serna and L's mother talked about the prosperity of the city, Kena pointed out that their plans had not been completely executed. L agreed with his red-haired sister, stating that there was still a lot to do before they were finished. Holding a cup of coffee, Serna asked what the next plan was for all of them. L, who was also sipping his coffee and waiting for it to cool a bit, explained to his family that the plans from now on would cost a lot of money, and their top priority should be to raise funds to continue building his magical tower. He also told his family, while drinking his coffee, that he was now going to meet a very important person. This news surprised Serna and Kena, trembling, they wondered who their brother could mean by an important person, understanding as if he might be visiting a lover who could potentially be competition. Serna noted that she had never seen her brother like this before and wondered who on earth he could be visiting that he would talk about in such a way. Meanwhile, Elle's mother also sat at the table, sipping coffee and visibly pleased that some peace had settled around her family, allowing them to enjoy life now. The sea occasionally brought small waves to a beach, splashing onto the beautiful golden sandy shore. The water was crystal clear, with only a few small stones scattered on the beach. L walked along the shore with his family, stating that he needed to introduce them to someone important. While his sister Serna said she couldn't wait to meet the person who was so important to him. Only their mother had a slight grin on her face. Because she was the only one who understood how their two daughters, as well as their only son, felt and what their words truly meant. Startled, Serna and Kena turned to their mother and asked why she was laughing. Elle's mother apologized only for her laughter and let it go. The family walked along the beach together, repeatedly wondering where this important person could be. However, there was nothing else to be seen on the entire beach except for occasional seaweed and a few barrels full of seafood. The group could not discern more than a simple beach, Elle turned around and asked his family if this wasn't simply incredible, explaining that he found this beach particularly cool. He elaborated that this was the western side of the Tolian kingdom, known for its seafood. Additionally, El lamented that, unfortunately, this area had few or no magicians, making it a very poor territory unable to properly sell the delicious seafood. As El explained this to his family, he suddenly remembered that he had forgotten to tell them who actually owned this territory. However, before he could reveal the name, the earth suddenly shook, and a significant tremor spread. The family's gazes turned towards the source of the tremor, wondering what could cause such a noise. Over a few trees, they saw a large black cloud rising from the middle of the forest, realizing that this was the source of the tremor. In the midst of the forest, there was a large wall, and a few archers were trying to prevent some orcs from breaching their walls. They drew their bows and aimed at the attacking large green pigs. Before the orcs could jump to the wall, the guards shot their arrows down. However, the arrows were deflected by the large green orcs, who then drew their weapons and launched their attack. One of the orcs jumped right to the wall and held onto it, climbing up. There were only a few inches left to prevent the orc from reaching the wall. 
The commander of the guards recognized this and ordered his soldiers to pour some oil over the area, causing the orc to lose its grip and fall. Unfortunately, his soldiers had to inform him that they had already used all their oil and had none left. While the commander contemplated what defense strategy remained, the large pig got closer to its goal. Suddenly, a voice rang out, saying that she would take care of it, shocking the commander as he looked to his right. A person appeared with a slightly yellow cloak, resembling a last-minute savior. It was Rowlin, who had authority over this territory. Rowlin had lightly pink hair, red eyes, and wore a blue top, sort of riding pants, and boots. A sword hung from her belt on the left side. Confidently, she spoke to her soldiers, instructing them to cover her. They immediately jumped onto the wall. Taunted the orc below, and then leaped off the wall to charge directly at the area. In midair, Rowland drew her sword and dispatched the orc as if it were nothing. Afterward, she mentioned that orcs didn't know when to give up, and that was a commonality that would connect them. As she continued to fall down the wall, she aimed for her next target, asking the other orc if he was upset that she defeated his comrade. Before Rowlin touched the ground, her grip on her sword tightened, enveloping it with an aura. She then swung the sword, defeating the other orc with a single blow. Taking a brief moment to catch her breath below, she apologized to her defeated opponents for her victory and explained to them that losing wasn't one of her hobbies. The soldiers holding the bridge cheered for their leader who had successfully defeated the two attackers. Suddenly, Rowlin noticed something behind her and turned around in shock, only to find another orc making its way onto the wall. This orc had managed to reach the top and was about to strike one of the soldiers with its club. The soldier was so shocked by the orc that he was paralyzed and couldn't move in the face of his impending death. As the orc saw its chance and prepared to eliminate the soldier, a fireball flew from behind, igniting the orc before it could cause greater harm. Rowlin looked up and recognized that this fireball seemed to be a sign of magic, wondering where it came from. As before, Elle suddenly emerged and apologized for possibly startling her, still holding some residual magic from the fireball in his palm. Smiling, he mentioned that he had found exactly the person he had been looking for from the beginning, looking at Rowlin. While El had sprinted ahead to assist Rowlin, his siblings and his mother were busy running through the dense forest. Leading the way was Serna, wondering where the heck her brother was, followed by Cana and their mother, amazed that their son could run through this thick forest as if it were nothing. Eventually, Serna managed to navigate through the dense forest and emerged into a clearing. Along with her sister and mother. She was overjoyed to finally be out of the forest thicket. The first thing Elle's mother wondered was if they saw their son. Their gazes shifted to Elle and became somewhat alarmed. Elle was just saying to Rowland that he would like to talk to her, as his sisters also looked at Rowland. Both Serna and Kana wondered, seeing their mother's shocked expression, if this pretty woman was the one their brother meant as the important person, and if Elle might mean love when referring to this important person. Rowland pointed her sword at Elle asking what he meant by wanting to talk and reminding him that this was their first meeting. She also warned Elle not to make a wrong move. Unfazed and emotionless. Elle admitted that he probably made a mistake and explained that he was just excited to finally see her in person. He then introduced himself with a smile, telling Rowland that he was a mage from the Tolian kingdom and that he had come today to discuss something with them. However, Rowlin wore no smile and questioned Elle about why she should believe him, displaying a very hostile expression. In response, Elle unleashed his magic, creating a swirling stream of his magic toward Rowlin. Sensing Elle's mana, Rowlin had to acknowledge that the mana she felt was on a completely different level and that this strength couldn't come from an ordinary mage. Realizing that Elle was likely not lying and telling the truth. She sheathed her sword, placed her hand on her chest, apologized to Elle, explaining that she had been somewhat rude but only wanted to protect her territory, and then asked for forgiveness. Afterwards, Rowland suggested continuing the conversation in another location and invited Elle, Serna, Cana, and their mother to Count Luvius's residence. The residence was situated on a cliff, offering an impressive view of the mirror-blue sea. 
Upon arriving at the residence, Rowlin served her guests tea. While she apologized for it not being particularly expensive tea, the protagonists weren't bothered as the tea was delicious. Elle's mother even praised the aroma of the tea, expressing surprise at how good it was. Nevertheless, Rowlin apologized again for not being able to offer her guests more comforts. Unlike his mother, Elle was more skeptical. He recognized that the tea was good but also knew that it could be easily purchased, and there was nothing particularly extravagant in the castle. Even Rowland's attire was plain and simple. Elle realized that the financial situation of this territory was worse than he initially thought, Rowland directly asked her guests why they had come to visit her today. Elle responded and explained that this territory, governed by Count Luvius, had been attacked not only by orcs as earlier mentioned but also by manticores. However, he assured her that she no longer needed to worry about it. Surprised, Rowland asked Elle if he would help her, to which Elle replied that they no longer needed assistance. This puzzled Rowland, who wondered why they no longer needed help against such monsters. L explained that he had already taken care of most of the manticores himself and that he had built a magical tower in a city in the former Manticore Gorge, preventing any further attacks on this territory. The news shocked Rowlin, who was visibly amazed and speechless. Even seconds later, she remained silent, sitting in a state of shock. L attempted several times to address the Countess, but she remained in a state of shock. L's mother recognized that it must be a state of shock. A few seconds later, Rowland apologized for the brief interruption and snapped out of it. Although still somewhat skeptical, she had to admit that she had seen fewer manticores than usual lately, making her more inclined to believe L. L responded that soon all the usual manticores would disappear. Slowly, Rowland's eyes filled with tears, and she thanked L, stating that this was one of the best pieces of news she had heard in years. She could hardly find words of thanks, let alone a way to express her gratitude. L was shocked by the gratitude he received, even though he had not yet come to the main point of his conversation. He thought about what he actually wanted to tell her but was relieved that he could help once again. Eager to see how Rowlin would react when he told her about his plans to strengthen her family throughout the kingdom, L couldn't answer yet when L's mother spoke up. She explained that Elle's father was from the Luvius family and that they were mainly here because Elle seemed very concerned about belonging to this family. The mother further explained that Elle's father was Rion Luvius, making the two of them likely cousins. These revelations astonished Rowlin, Rowlin confirmed that Rion Luvius was indeed part of her family. She explained that Rion had protected this territory from monsters until the day he was abducted and reported missing. Rowlin was once again shocked by this news and needed a moment to process that Rian had a son. Relieved that Rowlin took this news well, L expressed his belief that the fact of his father made them family. He also explained that when someone in his family was going through a tough time, he believed they should help each other. Serna, Kena, and L's mother listened attentively to L's warm and heartfelt words. As the waves of the sea crashed against the rocks, and the sound of the sea permeated the castle walls, El assured Rowland that with his help, she could continue protecting the people in her territory from further harm. Once again, tears streamed down Rowland's cheeks, and she apologized for showing a vulnerable side of herself. Encouragingly, El's mother said that she thought Rowland was an exceptionally cool person. Even if she shed tears at the moment. However, Rowland disagreed, insisting that she be addressed by her first name, as people usually referred to her with her title as Countess out of courtesy. Elle's mother, being particularly empathetic, gladly accepted the offer and introduced herself by her first name, Silfer. Serna, Kena, and Elle also introduced themselves once again, all wearing happy expressions, glad that their family member seemed to be a nice person. As a token of gratitude, Rowland asked if it would be okay to invite the family to a very famous place in the Luvius territory and then inquired if they liked the sea. Excitedly, the three girls confirmed that they heard correctly and looked forward to a trip to the sea. Rowland winked at the three women, mentioning that the weather outside was beautiful, and they could take a little excursion. The water was crystal clear, as always, 
and gentle waves rolled up and down the shore. As El's mother, Serna, and Cana walked along the beach, they once again marveled at the beauty of the sea. While the three women enjoyed the cool water and splashed around, Rowlan explained to El that the sea was the only place in the entire territory they could boast about. El looked at one of the barrels and asked Rowlan if the sea was always so clear and deep in this location and if there should be plenty of seafood. Rowlan looked somewhat surprised at El but confirmed his assumption. She also glanced at the barrel overflowing with seaweed and explained to El that they had so much seafood that they couldn't consume it all, so they stored some in barrels like these, additionally, they hadn't found a good way to export them. As always, El directly asked Rowlan what she would think about selling him all the excess seafood. Rowlan would be somewhat surprised about what El would do with all the seafood and asked him if he was serious and what he intended to do with it. He explained to her that she had more seafood, that it would be better for him, and that she wouldn't have to worry about any transport costs or logistics. He also explained that all the seafood could be transported in a magic box. Which would be easy, and asked her to please accept his offer. Smiling, Rowlan recognized that there was a specific plan behind her cousin's expression and asked him if she was right. However, she also accepted El's request and agreed to supply him with all the excess seafood in the future. El was overjoyed to hear that his request had a positive outcome. In this world, potions are mainly used to amplify the energy of one's own body and harness the regenerative power of the body to heal wounds, for example. A main ingredient in such a regeneration potion is the blood of a manticore. To use this blood, the temple employs a special purification method to cleanse it and make it usable for production. However, there are unfortunately far too few potions in the kingdoms, nowhere near the quantity needed to heal all the injured. The main issue is the blood of a manticore, which cannot be easily delivered on demand. This resulted in a bitter day to hold auctions in the marketplaces for this ingredient. Accordingly, the temple was astonished when Dybal informed one of the temple knights in the Dajek Kingdom's Reynard Church that he possessed a whopping 300,000 bottles of highly sought-after manticore blood. When the priest heard Dybal's claim, unbelieving as he was, he wanted to hear it again and asked for confirmation. Dybal told the priest, named Virek, that he knew a person who had such a quantity of blood. He also asked priest Virek how much of the amount he could take. Virek considered for a moment and then said that his church, powerful in holy magic, could use at most 10,000 to 30,000 bottles of this blood. Dybal then sighed, he hadn't expected the church to need so little and had anticipated a quantity around 100,000 bottles. This, in turn, surprised the priest, the priest had to react quickly and thought that a quantity of 100,000 bottles, while extremely large, could be manageable if he could mobilize nearby churches and collaborate with them. Additionally, he saw this as his golden opportunity to increase his influence and make substantial profits from dealing with Dybal. Not surprisingly, driven by his greed, priest Virek changed his mind and told Dybal that he would gladly take 100,000 bottles of the blood. Dybal skillfully tried to solidify the priest's decision by expressing surprise and asking if it was really okay for him to suddenly order so much. To further play his role as a traitor, Dybal began explaining that this blood would also be highly sought after by other churches on the continent, proposing a price of 300,000 gold coins without a discount. Without much negotiation, the priest accepted Dybal's extremely lucrative offer and thanked him. However, Virek couldn't hide his curiosity and asked in the end who would provide such a valuable material in such quantity. Smiling, Dybal stated that the person in question was, in simple terms, the greatest genius of their time, thinking of El. El stood at the top of his magical tower, looking down at the city that had developed around it. As his gaze wandered over the city, he couldn't believe that this area was the notorious Manticore Gorge. He looked at the small warehouse next to his magical tower, where workers were currently transporting crates containing the valuable manticore blood, ensuring the city's income remained stable. He recalled how, after capturing the manticores, he transported them to his interdimensional space using his magic. He fed them with the seafood he received from his cousin. 
After the manticores had something to eat, the people of the city extracted their blood. While initially, some of the smaller manticores objected to the villagers taking their blood, Bell resolved this with the help of a new pet in the manticore kingdom. Before long, a true symbiosis developed between the manticores and the villagers. Thanks to the manticore's special and unique regenerative ability, they quickly regenerated their own blood, creating a continuous cycle. Through this cycle and symbiosis, a true friendship emerged, along with the opportunity for the village to generate enormous profits. While El still stood atop his tower, he reflected on the fact that not many people were aware of the magical tower now present in the Manticore Gorge. Since the transportation of goods occurred through a teleportation portal, even the nearby roads showed no signs of a particularly large amount of resources being transported to create such a tower. Nevertheless, there were rumors occasionally circulating that a new magical tower was being formed, one that would rival the other magical towers in most cities. El knew, however, that he had to act very cautiously to avoid jeopardizing the peace he had established. While standing thoughtfully on his tower, he heard someone rushing into his room urgently. Swiftly reacting, he teleported back into his room through a small portal. Just as he arrived, Kana burst through the door, loudly calling his name. Kana looked genuinely alarmed and agitated. Naturally, El wanted to know what was going on, so he asked his sister what was new and why she was in such a hurry. With tears streaming down her eyes, Kana cried and said that something was wrong with her sister. A cold shiver ran down El's spine, and he couldn't believe what he had just heard. Alongside Kana, he ran down the corridor, opened the door to Serna's room, and called her name. Upon entering the room, Serna lay in her bed, with their mother already sitting by the bedside, tending to her daughter. Serna had an elevated body temperature, was sweating, and could barely breathe. El promptly asked his mother if she was sick and what was wrong with her. His mother replied that she had no idea what had happened and implored her son to use his magic to find out what was happening with his sister. Aware of his mother's serious expression and Serna's labored breathing, El touched her wrist and tried to use his magic to discern what was happening within her. He was astonished and wide-eyed when he realized that the mana inside her body was slowly dissipating. He also recognized that something else was beginning to develop within her. At first, he couldn't determine whether it was a dark aura like that of a demon or the holy aura of heaven. After a while, he explained to his mother and Cana that, if he was correct, the new strength in Serna's body was a holy power. He also said that they had made a mistake, and now the entire continent would be after his sister. El's mother and Kana couldn't believe what El had just discovered, furthermore, El stated that they should not waste any time because certain people might have already become aware of this event. He quickly instructed his sister, Kana, to take care of Serena, to which she immediately agreed. He then explained to his family that he needed to create a barrier around the village immediately. His mother asked if it had to be done right away, and El confirmed, assuring them not to worry and that he wouldn't be home for a while. After that, he disappeared through a portal, leaving his family alone in Serena's room as he returned to the magical tower. Wondering how long it would take to erect a barrier around the entire city, he was aware that it should not matter if it took a bit more time, he had to ensure he did it correctly. El had a determination in his eyes signaling that he must protect his sister at any cost. Immediately, he raised his hand, unleashing his magic. Below him, a magical circle appeared instantly, swirling around him as if dancing. A large beam of magic shot into the sky, splitting at the top to form a barrier. The magic cascaded like a vast glass dome around the city. Meanwhile, in the Holy Kingdom of Gaia, in the Vatican, a high priest announced that the day they had been waiting for had arrived. This anticipation dated back 300 years, to the first time they received a prophecy. Alongside the elder priests, a young apprentice knelt, eagerly listening to his master's words. Together, they gazed at a large, brightly glowing source of manna that provided them with a prophecy about darkness. The manna source conveyed that the time had come to be joyful yet fearful and that the world bathed in a constant flow of change. 
Additionally, the elder and younger priests marveled as the prophecy continued. Revealing that there was a place that had never been understood and that a beauty as bright as light would emerge there to fill every dark place with light. The prophecy also pointed out finding a flower at this location, unmistakably referring to Cerna. The elder priest asked his younger colleague, Artemos, if he understood the prophecy, and the younger priest explained that the prophecy could mean the Levitan Plateau, where the souls of darkness existed. He further explained that the mention of the flow could be about magic. Continuing to convey his interpretation of the prophecy, sentence by sentence, he suggested that the prophecy might announce a new saint. His master found his interpretation perfect and praised his student for it. Subsequently, he tasked them with announcing the revelation of the saint and declaring that a new saint would appear on their continent. They were instructed to collaborate with the Tolian kingdom and its knights, he then said that the appearance of a new saint was the will of God, and his disciples should put all his devotion into fulfilling these tasks. Completely euphoric and blinded by the prophecy, he also made it clear to his student that the Holy Kingdom currently possessed the strongest power of all time and that the arrival of a new saint had been expected for over five hundred years. Meanwhile, Cerna visibly suffered, her body temperature rising, and breathing becoming increasingly difficult. Cana had tears in her eyes as she watched her sister in such pain, hoping that she would overcome it all. In contrast, Elle's mother prayed for her daughter to pull through. Elle continued with the plan to erect a barrier to protect his sister. Like a good, loving mother would, Elle's mother, who stroked the strands from her daughter's face, touched her cheek, and hoped that she would soon feel better, anticipating the time when they could have fun together again. Elle, who was back in the room by now, explained to his family that, in the meantime, the manna in Serena's body was slowly but surely being replaced by holy power. He also reminded them that, Unlike other ordinary mages or knights, Cerna had an enormous amount of mana in her body. Due to this immense amount of mana, an equally massive amount of holy power had to be channeled into her, and this quantity was responsible for the intense pain she was currently experiencing. L also stated that they could not stop this process, and there was nothing they could do to prevent Cerna from becoming a saint. He knew that the Holy Kingdom would inform everyone about the birth of a new saint, and it was only a matter of time before they found Cerna. Cana knew that this holy kingdom, which revered the gods, would spare no effort to take her sister into their custody, El's mother also knew that a saint had no freedoms and that, in principle, it would make no difference whether she were a saint or in hell. She absolutely did not want such a fate for her daughter, and she would do everything in her power to ensure that her beloved daughter would not lead such an unhappy life. When Cana sensed her mother's loving thoughts, she made the decision to do everything she could to protect her precious sister. L, too, wanted to do everything to save his beloved family member from such a fate, and he reassured his mother and sister that they would be able to protect Cerna. Suddenly, a small sound filled the room, drawing closer to L until it transformed into a magical letter. As L looked down at the letter, he recognized that it seemed to be from the royal palace. Curious, Elle's mother asked what the royal palace wanted and if anything special had happened. While Elle read the letter, he explained to his mother that the royal palace wanted him to attend the royal conference. Skeptical, his mother asked why he, of all people, should participate in the royal conference, to which Elle replied that he had no idea why. His only guess was that they might want him to officially announce that he had built a new magic tower and that he would declare his alliance with the third prince to strengthen the Essen faction. However, L also knew that magic towers traditionally held a neutral stance regarding a kingdom, and this invitation potentially would not bring any changes to his plans. Worried and sad, L's mother looked up at him and asked what he was planning again. Somewhat self-satisfied, he looked down, then set off, telling his mother and sisters that he would return soon and that they should please take care of Cerna in the meantime. In conclusion, L's mother wished him a safe journey and asked him to return in one piece. L headed to his cousin's residence. It was still without valuable furnishings and quite simple. L immediately recognized that his cousin's territory was much more stable than it had been a few days ago. 
Rowland said that it had only been possible to have such a stable territory because L had helped her and thanked him once again. However, she was curious about why L had visited her today, as she couldn't believe that he would simply stroll around her territory without an ulterior motive. To which L asked her if he was that easy to read, Rowland responded with a sobering look, stating that even though they hadn't known each other for long, everyone would think that L never did anything without ulterior motives. L, once again, wanted to be direct and asked Rowland if she wouldn't want them to attend the royal conference together to bring the Luvius family a step closer to world politics. This news surprised Rowlin, who asked if she understood L correctly. L said that he believed, with her skills and the support of a magic tower, she could be capable of restoring the Luvius family to an important and influential noble status. He suggested that their financial difficulties could be alleviated with the export of seafood. Furthermore, L explained to Rowland that she was still famous for being a sword expert at such a young age and that she had a group of knights who followed her. If these knights decided to fight under the name of the Luvius family, their political power would become even stronger. All of this would contribute to the Luvius family restoring its honor. Rowland grasped L's words. She thought for a moment but doubted that, even if her family continued to grow steadily, they would still not be on par with other families. L asked her if she might be referring to the Tarendel family, to which Rowland widened her eyes and asked why he specifically mentioned that family for comparison. L explained that this was a famous story, and he had heard that the second son of that family persistently proposed marriage. Moreover, they took advantage of the fact that the Luvius family had recently been under monster attacks to continue pressuring them to accept the marriage proposal. However, L also pointed out that this family was the reason monsters could keep infiltrating the Luvius family's territory. Rowland had to control herself and squeezed her hands slightly. She knew that the Tarendel family was an arrogant and shameless family. Yet, she also knew that the family had a higher status than hers and exploited that fact. Ashamed of her own situation, she looked down at her hands, prompting Elle to say that the time had come for her to declare the true strength of her own family and stand up against this unfair treatment. He also sensed that Rowland wanted to seize her chance, to change and no longer passively watch as her family continued to lose honor, but to slowly rebuild that honor. To reaffirm this and to continue encouraging her, L mentioned that he was a seventh-level mage and recently acquired a magic tower. He emphasized that he was on the same level and social standing as the Tarendel family, just not in a kingdom but across the entire continent, in this kingdom, he might even manage to achieve a higher status and ensure that no further harm comes to the Luvius family. Rowland looked moodily at L and asked him why he was being so warm and kind to her. She then shouted loudly, questioning whether it might be because he had some ulterior motives. L denied this and told her not to trivialize the whole situation. He explained that they were cousins and that she should stop looking at him sexually. She admitted she misunderstood and apologized for her behavior. L, however, understood that due to the many difficult situations Rowland had been through, it was hard for her to accept goodwill and believe in the innocence of people. This was also a reason why he felt compassion for her, as she had been on her own for so long. He was all the more pleased that he could now lend her a helping hand. Afterward, L took his leave and bid farewell to Rowlin. He reminded her that it would start tomorrow, and he would pick her up for the conference using teleportation. Until then, she should take care of everything else. L teased her a bit, joking that she actually thought he wanted something sexual from her. Rowlin apologized once again, while L just made light of his little joke. Meanwhile, an important meeting was taking place in the castle. And a fist was forcefully slammed onto a table. An older man with a funny beard and thinning hair asked the conference what they intended to do as the second prince's faction was in danger. He also explained that the plan to weaken the first prince's faction had failed, and the third prince's faction had even gained more power. He reiterated to everyone present that if this plan continued to run this way, they would inevitably lose power. He asked the group of older gentlemen if anyone might have an idea to prevent this. However, the old gentleman at the table just looked down and remained silent. 
The older man with the funny beard raised his voice once again, asking for ideas. A hand went up. And another of the gentlemen began to speak. He looked like me when I make these videos, with mega dark circles and way too little sleep. So, please give me a like and leave a comment. The older man said he had an idea and wanted to share it at the instruction of the man with the funny beard, the person in question was Marquis Brilkend. Marquis Brilkend reiterated the fact that the first prince's sphere of influence remained stable while the third prince's influence expanded. However, he also emphasized that there was no cause for concern. Furthermore, he stressed that they still possessed a formidable military force. He then whispered his diabolical plan, leaving the other dignitaries at the table astonished. Finding it hard to believe what they had just heard. The man with the funny beard, on the other hand, had to acknowledge that he expected nothing less from Marquis Brilkend. He deemed the method effective and was speechless at the cleverness of Marquis Brilkend's idea. Marquis Brilkend expressed gratitude for the commendation and pledged to work diligently to implement his plan so they could achieve their goal. The man with the funny beard then stated that they belonged there as well.